Welcome, fellow citizens. I'm Larry Platt from the Philadelphia Citizen. And uh, in the aftermath of the conviction of uh, John Doherty and uh, uh, City Councilman uh, Bobby Heenan, uh, we wanted to do something special. Uh, rather than have me bore you with another written piece that puts you to sleep, uh, I, I decided to um, uh, get a couple of folks on a Zoom to talk about what we saw this week, the meaning of it. Like, let's get beyond the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, headlines here and, and go deep on corruption in Philadelphia and where we go from here. So I've asked, uh, if you don't know Sam Katz, uh, you should. Uh, Sam Katz ran for mayor in 19, well, in 1991, burst onto the scene running for uh, mayor, uh, sort of the young Republican reformer upstart uh, who made tremendous headlines, uh, and then ran for mayor in 1999 in an amazing race that I remember feeling very good about the future of Philadelphia, in which Sam Katz, the Republican, candidate and John Street, the uh, Democratic uh, candidate, went across the city holding forums about issues for months, declared their love for one another. It's hard to, it's hard to think about that in today's terms. And Katz lost uh, one of the closest elections in our history by, I want to say, 8,000 votes. There was a rematch in, very controversial rematch in 2003. Uh, and then what makes Sam Katz a, an iconic Philadelphian is uh, he didn't stop there. I should also say he's an uh, immensely successful businessman, but he reinvented himself as sort of the premier documentarian of Philadelphia history. Um, and I have such respect for the fact that he figured out, he lost three job interviews uh, by, uh, uh, at, at, the, at the whim of the Philadelphia electorate and still figured out a way to express his love and service for Philadelphia. So Sam Katz, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Thanks for having me, Larry. Uh, it was a close election in, 2000, in 1999, and um, 2003 was close for a while. Um, and then basically an FBI investigation into uh, drugs and possibly corruption. We'll never know. Um, well, there was corruption because people did go to jail, but um, that was an election in which I basically became a footnote. So I, uh, and in no small part because of the work of John Doherty and the Electricians Union and others. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I have, and, and the, the, the filmmaking uh, isn't just about love. <laughs> it's, it's I, I do love the city on most days, um, but I also think that it's important for us to face our history and not to try to sugarcoat it with everything 1776, which has, I believe, happened far too often. Amen, amen. And, and by the way, that 2004 race, or 2003, I guess it was, right? Um, you were ahead in the polls, 47 to 42, with when that bug in Mayor Street's office was, was found. I remember I was at Philly Mag at the time saying, well, that's it, Sam Katz was elected yesterday. <laughs> And, I, I remember that too. <laughs> it couldn't have been more wrong uh, because, because the Democrats brilliantly, diabolically uh, tied everything back to the George W. Bush uh, White House and, and the Attorney General at the time, John Ashcroft. Um, uh, and yet you didn't, you didn't go Nixon and say you won't have Sam Katz to kick her out anymore. You, uh, you continued to serve the city. And and like I said, I have immense uh, admiration for that. Um, I wanted to talk, I, I, and I forgot that, that, that you're unique. By the way, there was this film about that race, uh, The Shame of the City, in which there is footage of John Doherty's goons uh, following you around and intimidating you. And if I remember correctly, trying to intimidate your wife. I, it was more than my wife. It was also my children. And wherever the family went as surrogates, uh, there were Doherty people um, holding up signs and interrupting them and harassing them. And I 
really thought that was below the belt. I mean, as far as what he did when I was present, that's fair game, I suppose. It wasn't particularly appreciated, but it was, a, I was the candidate, not Connie and not my children. But I'll never forget it, and I haven't forgotten it. You know, one thing I learned in politics is no slight is too small to uh, let pass. Uh, and that was a pretty, I actually visited a couple of hospitals on election day uh, to see workers who had been um, physically beaten uh, and injured in an election that at that point I was down 14 points and I wasn't going to win. And yet um, the power that uh, Doherty needed to exhibit physically on the streets in, in South Philadelphia uh, was too hard for him to resist. Mm. So uh, I reached out to you because uh, uh, I wanted to get a sense from you. First of all, you have this personal history with, with uh, uh, Doherty, uh, but you're also uh, someone who I think of as an expert when it comes to uh, the history of corruption in Philadelphia. And we always talk about the, the phrase, the famous Lincoln Steffens phrase, uh, corrupt and contented. And I want to get to that culture in a minute. But first, let's take a moment to listen to two excerpts from the wiretaps from the recent trial. Cobb, if you could cue those up. There we go. Hey. And then I said the fire. Hello. He said he hasn't seen any any of this stuff down. Yo, yo. Hey, I'm in a, I'm in a meeting. I air styled you, but it was it's a good air style. Hey, look, chop. Looks like the L and I the electrical. I think it's that fucking Bob Parisi. Okay, is down there just playing stupid games. They shut them down because they got guys from out of town coming in doing highly technical work at Children's Hospital for Siemens, you know? And then Ellen and I went out and shut them down and then somebody gave them the okay, they said, inside the system that I don't know work. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Well, the other one, the other part was me. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, I'll walk over personally. Just, then, just, see, see, see what's going on, okay? Yep. You got buddy, thanks. Sure. And now here's the second one. Hey, the Chico's been calling me right now. I'm getting emails and texts, and then he just called me and said, Look, how are you guys? I work for them. I'm trying to get this resolved. This goes to court. I said, Listen, Frank, it ain't going to court. Okay. I said, So I just texted him. I just texted him. I said, Look, you know, this is simple. I, I kept a very business that track. I've been with these guys forever. I said, I'm, a, I'm only one small component. This is the way they treat everybody in this town. Okay? So, listen, I worked it out with Pelsey. Pelsey, Pelsey said to me the numbers they gave him are completely jerk-off numbers. Nobody can do it. He said, it's absolutely terrible. You have to be paying cash. Or Vertical Solutions does a lot of Comcast business all over the place. So, they're a big provider. So you can use Vertical, say, hey, if you, we can use Vertical Solutions as a, as a compromise point, this is an easy deal. And they deal with Vertical Solutions everywhere. We can work with them. So it's not a, it's not a personal contract. It's a guy, one of their guys. So, hey, when you say to say, hey, go back and check Vertical Solutions. No. That's who we look with. Dick Hayden just did a job. You know, Comcast still doesn't control the fiber in the city. So we just did a thing at Drexel. Very close competitor. Okay, so... Uh... Uh, I'll say, take a look at Vertical Solutions hey, numbers. Take, take we can work with them. Say, hey, look, we can work with Vertical Solutions. You do with them in Jersey and a lot of places in Philly. All right. right. Okay, Vertical Solutions. And you can to go through Frankie's on that? Or? Nah, nah, nah. You do it yourself with that guy. I just give him a okay. I'm right. going to send his latest email is I'm going to tell him, I'm in a meeting at cerebral palsy. I'll call after I said, we'll deal with me, you and him, and I'll call him, deal with him, okay? All right, you got it. I'll talk about So that first one was CHOP, uh, the MRI that was being uh, uh, installed at CHOP uh, without uh, union labor. When Heenan says, oh, really, the other part was me, he, uh, it seems like he's referring to when it was shut down by L&I, uh, and, and Doherty is telling him to, to go take care of that. Uh, and the other one is the, the Heenan in his role as, as, uh, com, as, as city council member uh, was negotiating with Comcast on the uh, city franchise, uh, cable franchise, and we hear uh, Doherty telling him what to say and taking his 
cues from former councilman Frank DeChico, who's now a lobbyist hired by Comcast, but looks like he's playing both sides of the equation and uh, Doherty sort of scripting out uh, for for Bobby, for his lieutenant, Bobby Heenan. So what what did we just hear? What did that really tell us? Well, I, look, the, the, this, the context is that here's a guy who has an enormous amount of power, uh, a very vested interest in who gets what work, how they get paid, uh, the use of government as a vehicle to protect his interests and the interests of his members, uh, which as a labor leader, certainly he is entitled to protect the interests of his members, but to have an, a guy who can then pick up the put the phone down and walk across the street and tell the Department of Licenses and Inspections, this is what you are going to do. Well, I don't have that. And I don't think most Philadelphians have that. And uh, a lot of people who would love to be able to get things done for their street or their house or their family don't have that. So what we've been hearing, what, what this conviction um, reflects is that Philadelphia city government is not for Philadelphians. It is a corrupt city. And this person, Doherty, has been the most corrupt part of the city without being a member of the city government. And I think that we have a unique opportunity at this moment. We've had these opportunities before. Uh, sometimes they have uh, been inflection points in the history of Philadelphia. Uh, in 1919, we had a new city charter that was pretty, pretty weak. In 1951, we had a new city charter that completely changed the city government and was a reaction to 80, 70 years of Republican corruption. But we've had this single party town since 1871, basically since 1836. And when you have no competition in the political world, uh, you end up with a situation in which domination by one party, and then within that party, domination by one group of people, uh, leads to a very unfair, inequitable, and expensive, uh, and pro progressive in in impeding process, which is what we have in Philadelphia. Uh, it goes back, it's not new. Un unfortunately, through too many occasions, and it's happening right now, uh, we, we tend in Philadelphia to treat it as charming. It's charming. Oh, it's just our character. Well, there's a huge tax that Philadelphians pay uh, in lost uh, growth as a city that people don't want to do business in, uh, in the unfair allocation of the best jobs, which oftentimes leaves out people of color. You know, Doherty created a, 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 a charter school which has uh, recruited a lot of students of uh, lower income, more at risk neighborhoods, very few of whom while becoming apprentices ever became union uh, laborers on a major job site. It's part of the, the allure of creating the image that is not backed up by any reality. And who, who paid for those charter schools? We, the citizens of Philadelphia. Um, th this is a case where we have a moment when we can decide that we're going to pass a couple reforms and make everybody feel good, or we're going to fix the damn system. And the system is badly broken. And if you look around in the political world, whether it's judicial, uh, executive, or legislative, everybody who got money from IBW Local 98 ought to give it back. Mm. Look, at your, look at your campaign report and take a look at how much money you got and give it back. Show people that you aren't willing to, to put up with this anymore. And then what have we seen? Practically nothing. Practically no one has anything to say. Yeah, it's, it is sad for the person's family, any criminal who gets convicted, it's sad for their family. But it's also sad for the people of the city. And I don't hear anybody other than Maria and Jared talking about that. Why? Are they afraid that he's gonna win an appeal? Was there a procedural problem with this trial? You know, everybody said who read the papers and read these quotes uh, that this case was weak. But until you hear the tone and the nature of these conversations, which the 12 members of the jury did hear, it's very difficult to put your arms around how utterly disgusting and abnormal this is. And so to hear at the end of the trial, 
uh, Mr. Doherty coming outside and saying, I've been convicted for doing business the way Philadelphia does business. He's right. We are all guilty of allowing this to happen, of being asleep, of seemingly not to care. And we have a moment where we could care. And if we take advantage of it, I think there is possibly a better future for the city. And if we don't, the stagnation that I think we've been living with for a long time will continue. So a couple of thoughts. One is that, one, remember, this was a federal trial. So you had people on the, on the jury who weren't just from Philadelphia, people from Lancaster, people from elsewhere in the state. One of the jurors said listening to those tapes was appalling. That was the word she used. Um, and, and I do think you're right that that, and I think I've been guilty of, of uh, uh, playing up the rogue nature of corruption here. I often quote Buddy C. and Franny when he was under investigation and he said of the US attorney, that guy ought to find another line of work if he can't nail me, right? Uh, there, there's, there, and, and, and that was fun, but you're right. There is a corruption tax that affects all of us. And I found that study that our, our late mutual friend Jeremy Nowak uh, cited. It was a 2014 Indiana University and Ho University of Hong Kong study that found that it was, a, that it was of states and it found that the average amount of corruption in Pennsylvania costs each resident of the Commonwealth $1,300. Um, a year, a year. Uh, yes, yes. So that's a, that, and that, so, you know, that's a real cost, but, but too often no one feels it. Uh, it's just headlines. Um, and, and I think what you're talking about is how do we get people to feel this? Well, I, I, I think we have to talk about it. You know, and I, I, I've said before to some people in the last 48 hours, the word reform is not the word. The word is anti-corruption. Uh, reform has historically been a was a very powerful word in the 1940s and early 50s when Clark and Dilworth were elected. Uh, it may have been a very important part of uh, Michael Nutter's election in 2007 uh, in, in Ray Pay to Play. But reform is a legislative process. We're gonna change some laws. We're gonna make you do this. We're, you know, what about character? What about the people who we elect? What about the institutions to which we elect them? Looking at a city council with 17 members, 10 of whom represent districts and have senatorial prerogative, it's a council mandate prerogative, but it's like a senator who can stop a nomination or stop something in their state. And we've bequeathed that power to 10 representatives of city government. Somebody today gave me a really good suggestion, which I wanna pass along, which is probably we need to change the charter, make city council a part-time job make it 25 or 30 districts, make them meet at night and have them meet in every neighborhood rotating around the city so the public can participate. It's really hard to go down there at 10 o'clock on a Thursday. But to give the power to a member of council, by the way, this is how Philadelphia city government worked before we enacted a strong mayor home rule charter in 1951, in which council members and the committees that they operated ran the departments. Here, this guy's running the department. Go across the street and tell them what they're going to do. And apparently, uh, L and I, in some cases, were, were enablers. Uh, and and so Philadelphia, you know, the corporate world, the, the the lobbying world, the donating world, we're all enablers. And we we have to wake up because the cities that we're competing with, the region that we're competing in, the states that we're competing with. Uh, to the extent that they tolerate this, they're falling behind the eight ball. To the extent that they don't, they're eating our lunch. And I would say, uh, given the economic curve on which Philadelphia currently sits, our lunch is being eaten. And it's not just by uh, other pl places, it's by the people who are corrupt. And we can, we can no longer continue to be contented. We have to be pissed off. It's time to say enough is enough. Give back the money. Change the structure of city government. Stop amending the charter to end the Iraqi war and legalize marijuana. These are not governmental functions of a charter. A charter is supposed to be the way we operate the government. And it's the, it's the local constitution. Well, that's the theory. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. American constitution only has 26 amendments or some, something like that. 
And none of them tell the Congress who gets appropriated what money, like this last amendment that uh, made, the, made the case that we have to appropriate money for the housing trust fund. If the housing trust fund turns out not to be a great idea, and I hope it's successful, um, I voted against that, that amendment, but what, what are we doing? These are political statements that get, make it a resolution. If the city council wants to spend its time making resolutions and voting on them, great. Don't ask the voters to change the governmental structure of the city by amending the charter with these ideas that are philosophical or ideological, but they're not governmentally structural and they're not important to the charter. But there's a lot to do. Um, Leadership is a key ingredient to, to Doherty's credit, and I don't give him any credit, but to Doherty's credit, he saw a vacuum in leadership and he filled it. He filled it with money. He filled it with violence. Uh, I worked for a long time at 12th and Callow Hill. The Gold Tex building was across the street. The police civil disobedience squad was there every day, notwithstanding the fact that the non-union workers who came out of that building on occasion got beat up. Uh, we saw a tape one day of Doherty walking down the street ready to kick the crap out of somebody. He was on camera. Violence was very, is very much part of the mix here. So I, I think we looked and heard and saw, we have seen, by the way, this for a long time, no criminal action ever taken against him not for, for violence, yeah. not for corruption, for violence, because the DA's office, at least at that point, uh, were in his pocket. You know, Seth Williams was in his pocket. So this is, um, it's enough, you know, I'm sick of it. I, I give Comcast some credit. Obviously they decided to push back. I heard in one of the tapes a reference to one of the senior executives there happens to be my neighbor, you know, who's giving them a hard time about the parking authority. Think about the parking authority. The parking authority was stolen from Philadelphia, by the way, probably in part to help me get elected uh, when Speaker John Prezell decided to put an amendment in a bill and make the Philadelphia Parking Authority a state agency. And it's all part of this cabal. Uh, uh, so I, you know, we, we don't have a parking authority whose business is to think about bringing new people into Philadelphia. No, put a ticket on their car, make sure they don't come back, get their car towed down to South Philly. This is a mess. And so, so I, I, I just think it's a long-term mess that we, we've allowed to tolerate and we have a chance to become a 21st century city and here is the moment. I wanted to get to that, but first take us on a, uh, I'd be remiss for anyone who's new to Philadelphia uh, uh, or, or doesn't know the history here for not asking you to walk us through the corruption culture here. There, there are, and you've documented this in your films, uh, which by the way, anyone who's interested in Philadelphia should should watch uh, and give them the what, what website should should they go to? Well, the the series making? that I would recommend is called Philadelphia: The Great Experiment. There are fourteen episodes. They're all on YouTube. Uh, if you start with the eighteen uh, seventies and watch, you know, through the nineteen seventies, corruption is there all the time. There's an episode nineteen twenty to nineteen forty that I intentionally named corrupt. Um, and that was the height of Philadelphia's corruption. You'll recall, if you've read the history a little bit, that uh, the mayor of Philadelphia wanted to try to break up the uh, prohibition uh, speakeasies and taverns that were proliferating all over the city, most of which were owned by ward leaders, and uh, brought in a, a, an ex-Marine, uh, Smedley Darlington Butler, who probably overstepped his boundaries, but went in to try to close these places down and got fired. And, I'll, and when the, the last part of that story is when Butler got fired, he took his service revolver, gave it to the assistant to the mayor, Mayor Kenrick, and told the mayor, he told the, the assistant, the mayor would know what to do with it, um, meaning to shoot himself. Um, the, the history starts really- uh, in, By the way, in Medley, I, I, I remember uh, he said, this was like a, a war hero. And he said the hardest thing he ever had to do in his life was try to clean up Philadelphia and rid well, it of he, corruption. He, he was unsuccessful doing it. So it wasn't that it was hard. He couldn't do it. It was he was he failed at it. He, he was not supported in any way by the political system. And we're talking, uh, you know, the 1920s. Things are very different today, maybe. 
Uh, in any case, you know, you begin to see in 1870, the first time African-American men, men get the right to vote. And the ward leader of the, of the fourth ward, which was Moya Mensing. So you're talking South Street, uh, maybe west of 7th, all the way up, I don't know how far beyond broad. But that was a, uh, an ethnic enclave, a democratic enclave, and a guy named William McMullen, who'd been in the Mexican War uh, and was an Irish Catholic, uh, and during the Bible riots of 1844, was very involved on the street with guns. He'd been shot many times. If you read the, the book about Octavius Caddo, uh, there's a lot in there about McMullen. So McMullen, on this first chance where uh, African American men had a right, to, had the opportunity to vote in a mayoral election, uh, sends a group of men out to the street to beat up African Americans, shoots Octavius Caddo, murders him. Five other black men were murdered. The, the, the idea was to tamp down the turnout. It didn't work. And the African-American community, appreciative of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, elected a Republican for the first time as mayor. They held that position, those positions until 1951. Uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, there were things called the building ring, the gas ring. James McManus ran the gas ring. What was the gas ring? It was the gas works. And it was a private company who, whose contracts were let in any way that McManus wanted to. Matthew Quay, who was the other boss in Philly, uh, was pissed off about that and wanted the McManus removed. The other interesting one was the building ring. And the very prominent, successful, and wealthy Peter A.B. Widener at one point was treasurer of the Republican Party, treasurer of the building commission which built City Hall, uh, and he was treasurer of the city, <laughs> all at the same time. Uh, when, that, when you look at Widener's wealth, much of it was accumulated through his political power. Uh, later on, you, you know the story of the Roosevelt Boulevard, the Theodore Roosevelt Boulevard. When it gets up to the Northeast and to Adams Avenue, it goes around in a circle. Why does it do that? Because the guy who owned the land there wasn't a good guy, a good Republican. We're not giving him the money. We're going to go this way. The stories abound in this way. And then in the 1930s and 40s, the corruption was so outrageous that when the investigation started, there were suicides. People jumped out of windows because they knew they were going to jail. And that led to the Clark Dilworth era. You would have thought, oh, that's the end of it. Then you have Abscam. And by the way, uh, before we get to Abscam, back then, uh, if you needed the police, you had to be, you had to pay, right? There, there was no such thing as, um, as, city services if you weren't connected? Well, when in the 20s and 30s, the, the police got paid off and uh, the police paid the captain. And you'll see this in our film, the, the captain paid the ward leader, the ward leader paid the boss. And <clears throat> the corruption was very well organized. It was very disciplined. And it was, there were a lot of good things, you know, if, if people need coal, uh, the party was providing it, the Republican Party would provide it. If people needed a job, somebody would get a job. If they needed a little bit of cash, they needed something for Thanksgiving. This was, by the way, the, the, the original uh, consolidation of the city in 1854 was because there were 29 municipalities. And if a cop wanted to chase somebody across South Street, they couldn't go into Moyen Mensing or Southwark. So the cops there would have to follow up, and they didn't. So the city put together. Uh, a city and county consolidated all 29 districts into one city and basically created the Philadelphia Police Department. But the fire department was not created until 1871. The fi fire companies were volunteer fire companies. And McMullen was the head of one of those fire companies in, in Moya Mensing, what's called the Moya Mensing Hose Company, which was a gang. It was a political headquarters. It was an interesting way that uh, Philadelphia fire companies put out fires. First, they started them, and they went into the house to loot them, and then they collected the uh, insurance money for having put them out once the house had burned down. That's a great but, business model. <laughs> the, the best version of that is, of course, in the gangs of New York, when you see uh, Leonardo DiCaprio go into the house and do that. But that, was a, that, that form of firefighting was invented in Philadelphia. Um, this This... 200 years of our history, and I would think we would be weary of it. I you, started to mention, you started to mention Abscam, which is 
always been one of my favorites. What what happened there? Um, basically, it was a you know shakedown of uh, I think if you've seen the movie that uh, Bradley Cooper was in and I forget the name of it, uh, that's the ab scam story. Uh, Angela Arquetti, who was mayor of Camden, got set up, and a bunch of city councilmen, George Schwartz, Harry Janotti, Ozzy Myers, uh, came out with a famous line from that. Uh, that was an attempt by the FBI and the Justice Department. Money, money, money talks and bullshit walks, right? When he opened the the suitcase with fifty thousand dollars of cash in it, uh, that 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 FBI agents who were playing or, uh, Arab sheiks. Arab sheiks, yeah, they were pe- playing investors, and they wanted to invest in Philadelphia. Uh, there was an element with Lee Beloff and uh, Bill Rouse. Uh, Rouse, of course, wasn't. Uh, it wasn't going to be pushed around. So Rouse was a famous developer who did Liberty Place and others, and Beloff and the mob tried to shake him down. And he he turned he he unlike what we've seen lately. Here's a developer who like stood up and took them on, right? Well, you know, I, I have to say the fellas who built uh, the, the, the uh, Goldtex building, yeah. uh, Matt and uh, Mike Pestron, they, they haven't backed down. I went by the Ninth and Poplar Street building that they've developed uh, on, the, on the train line near Temple, and there's a rat outside. There should be a rat outside the IBW headquarters on um, Spring Garden Street because that's where the rats live. Yeah, no, that's the, you're right. The, uh, the Pestronk uh, uh, brothers standing up for the last 10 years uh, has has been uh, instructive. The, but what is this culture? I mean, I, I don't think, by the way, this this tour you just took us on isn't even the half of it. No. So why are why why do we leave? It feels like Chicago can be corrupt, but Chicago's corruption is run of the mill graft. It seems like we are more you didn't even mention Fumo, who invented the the, the nonprofit to, to loot from. Um, it seems like we're almost more entrepreneurial in our corruption and, and tolerant of it. I've wondered often whether the proliferation of politically um, startuped, started startups of 501c3s of not pro- not-for-profits has created a different corporate vehicle uh, through which government grants can be directed by the same politicians who set them up. Uh, many charter schools. I don't say that the charter schools are corrupt, but the, the, there, there are problems that have been created by this proliferation of politically led 501 C3s. Uh, I think the parking authority is another place where, you know, they're very efficient. You know, you're one second beyond the meter. You got a ticket on your car, more money, more meter maids and meter readers, more meter readers, more money. (laughs) The idea, of course, originally was this was going to be good for the school district. I'm not so sure that it's been good for the school district, and I'm very sure it has not been good for the city. Why? Why are we like this? What is it about us? Um, I think it's because that the corruption really had, at one point, reached the level of the, of the division where the committeeman took care of your parking ticket. That's hard to do now. Uh, the committeeman made sure that if your kid needed a job or you had a, something you needed, and then they could count on your vote. Um, but in the 20s and 30s, you know, they didn't, you didn't have to vote. They voted for you. But that doesn't happen. Now people don't vote. You look at the turnout in this last uh, statewide election, and the difference between Democrats winning judicial seats and losing them is Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia failed to turn out. Now, you know, the people who got reelected in Philadelphia got got reelected handsomely, but Philadelphia didn't pull its weight uh, in terms of the statewide politics. So you know the the mayoral election is the big uh, Super Bowl of, of political poli- of Philadelphia politics, but it's not enough. You know we elect ten district councilmen, seven uh, council at large. Is it seven? Yeah, seven. Yeah. Um, we. We elect all these people. We don't even know who they are. When when I when we voted for judge, you know, Connie and I looked at the names. We didn't know any of them. We knew a couple, but we there was very little information. There was very little effort to educate us. And what are the consequences of having people who are supported by one union, who who in, in judicial positions who may well adjudicate cases of great interest to that union? Um, this appeal. 
uh, well, this is a federal case, so there won't be an appeal to the state courts, but the, the court system is rife with um, campaign donations from a corrupter and a corrupt politician and now a convict criminal. Uh, by the way, on the southwest corner of Dilworth Park, there is a little uh, uh, yeah. quote from your hero. Very uh, worth reading. Uh, and I have it here. It, it, uh, it's Richardson Dilworth, uh, who you met when you were seven years old. It made you want to become mayor someday. Uh, our lack of capacity for public indignation is due to the length of time we have lived under the domination of one political machine. He was talking about a different machine, a Republican machine, but we now know that it goes both ways, right? It, it, this isn't about party. It's about um, lack of competition uh, breeding corruption. Well, if you look at the reaction to this, this jury decision, I, I would like to find a reason to understand why the leader of the city has an opinion different than the jury. Well, what's that based on? Hey. And I, I'd like to hear members of the council call for Bob Heenan's resignation. He's been convicted of corruption and he's your colleague and you sit in a body in which you are going to let him continue to operate. What does that make you? So, you know, I, I just don't understand why, why everybody who wants to run for mayor in 2023 isn't already talking about the anti-corruption campaign that they're going to run. What, are they afraid of hurting somebody's feelings? The jury hurt his feelings. Uh, so I just, it's very, very disappointing. Uh, you were you're correct in your uh, assessment of the 1999 race that John and I had. We were, it was an open seat and we were trying to replace Ed Rendell, who was a very well regarded and a very popular mayor and a, I think a pretty successful one. But we were doing it by talking about issues. We aren't talking about issues. We're talking about money and influence and power and corruption. And that, that is the obstacle to being effective governing, governors of the city. You know, good governance usually doesn't look the other way when it comes to dealing with problems. I'm finishing a film on the bankruptcy of Detroit, which I'm proud to tell you was given the Library of Congress Ken Burns Prize for Film, the winner of the Library of Congress Ken wow. Burns Prize for Film. Wow, that's awesome, congrats. And the film is about what happens when you kick the can, in this case, the fiscal can, down the road for decades and run out of road. And when you run out of road, it's ugly. Pensions, you know, municipal employee pensions are on the chopping block. City services are on the chopping block. Debt obligations are gonna be haircutted. The fact that the city of Detroit owned its art museum and that brought in foundations, the state and the art community to provide resources, $816 million of new money is what saved the city and got, not saved the city, but got them out of bankruptcy. If a city that kicks the fiscal can down the road for decades doesn't own their own art museum, they're up the, the creek without a paddle. And when the Biden stimulus money, which saved a lot of cities over the last fiscal year and maybe over the next one runs out, which it will, and the impact of COVID on the commercial real estate market, on the small business market, on the number of commuters riding on SEPTO, all those things. Philadelphia is going to be back in the same hole it was in 1991 when I first ran for mayor because of my background in finance. So we're not, going, we're not in a position to, to solve problems because our governance is so weak. It's, it's so stratified. This councilman can stop this and that not in my backyard. You can't do this unless you give me campaign donations. You don't have the right lobbyist. You don't have the right lawyer. What about the rest of us? Mm. And uh, the outrage that lacks uh, presence in Philadelphia today is not a hopeful sign. But hopefully in a couple of days after people start to you know, take in what's just transpired, we'll see some courage on the part of the political class and I use the word class advisedly. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, last question is respond to, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, well, Doherty has said it and others have said it now that, that this was a, uh, that this verdict was criminalizing political activity, normal political activity, normal political lobbying. And even the mayor said, well, he, he did this sort of whataboutism with no one's looking at, at, at corporate influence of politicians. Uh, can you address that? Uh, what, what should our, is there a rebuttal to that in this case? In order to make a change, you have to identify what is the problem? What is the problem, not just this problem of corruption, but what does it cost us? What does it mean to us? What does it, oh, this, what does it prohibit us from doing? And do we wanna do those things? And if we do wanna do those things, you've got to sell a solution and you've gotta sell it every day. It's gotta be part of the language. And that's why I'm very concerned about people using the word reform. This is not the 1950s. And people are not going to respond, in my opinion, to that concept. So the language that we use, the messaging, uh, we, we need candidates of character. You know, I look at John Doherty, who went to St. Joe's Prep, and I have the highest regard for that school. Uh, it's a Jesuit school. Uh, there were values taught, character matters. What, he didn't go to school? He didn't take any of that with him. He's a smart guy. I mean, I, I've had not that many conversations with him, thank goodness, but he obviously is a smart guy. He obviously knows how to do things. He's very effective. He's hardworking. You know, I read in the paper, who's going to replace him? Nobody's going to replace him because if they tried today, it would take them as many years as it took him to become Doherty. Um, so I, I just think that the po political leaders of the city the business leaders of the city, the press, the, the press is a much, the media is a much bigger market than just the newspapers and the television. It's Philadelphia Citizen. It's all of the, the bloggers and Twitters and all, all of that. They need to talk about it. You know, Philadelphia 3.0, they need to talk about it. And the people who did, who do this stuff and act as if they didn't know, which most people did. Oh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about what he was doing. You need to look in the mirror because you're the problem. And if you want to be part of the solution, if you want the city to become an equitable city, a city that treats its citizens fairly, that gives them the same access to government and decision-making as it gives to the corporate, the union, and the well-represented um, interests, this has to change because we're headed in a bad path here. I think there, that's... There I think you've put your finger on the messaging. The messaging has to be about whose city is this? Whose city does this belong to? It's, it's, right. it's, a, it's a populist message as opposed to the good government uh, uh, egghead, and which I've been guilty of, of reform, uh, which is really just sort of 30,000 feet, uh, let's adopt this program, let's adopt that, that program. Uh, the, the, and, and by the way, I mean, we should talk about, about specific solutions. David Thornburg of Committee of 70 and, and State Rep Jared Solomon uh, have wrote an op-ed in which they suggest public financing uh, uh, elections like they do in New York, uh, eliminating dark money and restricting outside employment. Those, I'm in favor of all those. I'm not sure they get to what you're talking about though. Do they? Well, I, look, when, 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 the, when the political job is the best job you're ever gonna get in your life, you're not going to give it up very easily. And if it pays, you know, $130,000 a year, it's a darn good job, especially since the real heavy lifting is done by your staff to do constituent service work, which you'd like to think, boy, I don't need a city councilman to get the streets department to come over here and clean up something or, but you do. So unfortunately, I think that by making it a full-time job, you know, I, until Ed Rendell became uh, mayor, I never heard the term chief of staff, but every one of these guys in council has a chief of staff. And they have staffs and they have constituent offices and they have power and they have the ability to do things. Make it a part-time job. That's to me, that would be, uh, somebody made that suggestion. It's not my original idea. So I wanna, I'm not gonna quote the person, but you make it a part-time job and then anybody could be a city councilman. There's not going to be a reason to become a city councilman for money. 
And if you want to, you need a second job, you have to have a full-time job. You meet at night. Maybe you don't have quite as many hearings. Maybe you don't have quite as many resolutions. Maybe you don't have quite as many charter changes. Good. <laughs> That's a real... I, I do think we need a charter commission and I think we need a new charter. For reasons yeah. not having to do with corruption, uh, although that's not a small reason, a part of it. But generally speaking, the, the, the design of the Philadelphia city government, which by the way, was intended to be a strong mayor form of government. That was what the city charter designed. You appoint a professional manager, the managing director, a professional finance person, the finance director, and a lawyer, city solicitor, and a city, a city commerce director and a city representative, and then you have 10 departments, and we've proliferated this thing into this monster. It's $5.5 billion a year in city government. Do people really feel we're getting $5.5 billion worth of service? Now, there's a lot of things that have to be done. I mean, the recreation department uh, is doing, I think, a very good job of trying to rebuild recreation. It's tough. Um, the health department has just come through a brutal uh, experience. Uh, which, you know, it did some stupid things in the course of it, but, you know, a lot of people don't know how to deal with uh, pandemics. Uh, we have a tremendously divided um, community versus police. This is a major problem. Unsolved crimes, a community, large segments of the community who won't testify, who aren't willing to be involved in prosecuting criminals, which is very hard to do when you don't have witnesses. So you, you just have a system uh, you know, for many, many years, the district attorney's office wouldn't take on political corruption because they wouldn't, and they didn't want to. And if you have a, a judicial, if you have a, a prosecutorial system, which doesn't want to take on municipal corruption in the city in which you're elected to do that job, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty strong disadvantage to trying to shut down crime and corruption. All of these things need to now be talked about. We got, this is an opportunity for everybody in the community across the city to express their view about how they feel about what they want their future of the city to be. And I don't think we're having that conversation, but we have that opportunity. We don't need to spend all our time talking about Doherty and Heenan. Um, maybe some people will choose to visit them, but they are not going to be central to the decision making that's going to determine whether Philadelphia's pathway is going to be a progressive one or a regressive one. That's a great place to stop. And that's why I reached out to you and, and also uh, to, to uh, State Rep uh, Solomon and Councilwoman Sanchez, who we'll be talking to in a moment, um, because I, I do wanna get past the headlines and start talking about, you know, you're right in 2007, 2008, Michael Nutter, uh, uh, there was a movement of reform and, and pay to play was addressed. And we have that opportunity now, uh, if someone will harness it, uh, and and I, you know, this is this is a, uh, so I I I, I want to keep this conversation going. So Sam, thank you so much. This was wonderful, uh, and let's keep the conversation going. Thanks for having me, Larry. All right, man. Thanks.